it's finally time to start recording audio. Now make sure your sample rate, bit depth and buffer size settings from the previous video are set to how you want them. Since I'm going to take it from the very beginning and cover each and every step, if you are a more advanced user, I would suggest skipping ahead to the other recording videos. Now before we dive in, I will assume that you have an audio interface and you're not using your laptop's internal microphone or a USB microphone. If you are a complete beginner and you have absolutely no idea how to even connect your instrument to record it, I got you. I have a video on the subject, so check the description box for that. Let's start. To record audio, you need an audio track, not a software track. I already have four tracks here, and the first thing that I do, and that comes down to your personal workflow, is to name the track. Now that's good because of two things. One, you're well organized, and that is a lifesaver when the project starts having more than 30 channels. And two, when you record audio, if you don't rename your track, your region will be named as Untitled 1, 2, and so on. And that can be confusing if you go into the media folder uh, or the browsers up here. So by renaming your track first, your region automatically takes its name during recording. Now let's look at everything from the beginning, even though we somewhat touched on some of this. Now the first thing I want to talk about are these two little buttons here. The I is your input monitoring. Now we have two types of monitoring, direct monitoring and input monitoring. Now both do the same thing. They allow you to listen to your live signal. They don't function the same though. We'll talk about direct monitoring when we open the settings. Input monitoring is your live signal after it goes into the computer and is processed. So if you want to listen to what you're playing and listen to how it sounds after all the plugins you might have loaded, you click on this little I button to turn input monitoring on. Now next to that, we've got the arm record button. In audio, when you arm record a track, you're making it ready to record audio. So only the armed tracks will record audio. So let's look at the tracks we have here. I'll arm record two of them. So I'll select these two. And when I press record, you're going to see that only these two will start recording. Okay, let's command Z. The shortcut for these buttons are Ctrl and I as an in input for the input monitoring and Ctrl R as in record for the arm record. Now let's open up our preferences. I'm sure you know it by now. It's Command and Comma. And let's go to Audio. And let's make sure that our input and output are set correctly. Now normally for both it will be your audio interface. Mine are not the same because I need to route the sound to my screen capturing software. Really quickly now, if you are a complete beginner, we have input and output. And that is the pathway that our signal follows and it goes through your audio interface. Input, as the name suggests, inputs audio or information to your computer system. That in turn is converted to digital data. It goes to our DAW, logic in our case, and then we select the output, which is essentially where do we send the sound out, output, out of the computer. So if I click on it, you can see that I have the options of using my computer speakers or my screen speakers, create an aggregate device to split my signal, more on that on another video, or use my audio interface where I can either connect my headphones or monitors. Now, if you have headphones, you can also uh, select your computer speakers and only set the input at your audio, in audio interface. So for most of you, it will be input and output will be your audio interface. Now, let's put the buffer size down to 128 for now. And let's click Apply. Now, next to that, we've got the General tab. Before we look at our options here, now we can talk about direct monitoring. Now what I want you to do is to have a look at your audio interface and see if you have an option for direct monitoring. 
Now what that does is to take the input signal and send it directly to the headphones and the output. And that allows for almost zero latency. Now bear in mind, when you use that, you need to mute the audio track you are recording to. So what you'll hear is the other tracks, uh, the metronome and the direct monitoring input signal. So the difference with input monitoring is direct monitoring sends the signal straight to your headphones and output. Input monitoring gets the signal after it has gone into the computer and has been processed. And now you know why one of them has latency and the other doesn't. For me, it's always preferable to have direct monitoring on to take advantage of the almost zero latency, unless you want to use some effects while monitoring the input signal. And here's where our first option, uh, software monitoring, comes in. So if I have an instrument and I want to load an amp simulator, if this is off, I will not be able to listen to it in real time. I will have to record first and then preview it. If I turn software monitoring on though, then I can preview it in real time. Now by default, I think Logic has software monitoring off. So if you're trying to load a plugin and you can't hear it during recording, make sure to turn this one on. Now, if you need to turn it on and off quite often during a project, uh, doing, doing it through the menu is time consuming. Instead, you can add the button for it on the control bar. So just right click here, uh, customize control bar, and it's this one here. It's this little green button here. Now, underneath that, we have input monitoring only for the focus track. Now, I prefer to leave this one on, and here's what this does. Now, let's look at our tracks here. And let's turn input monitoring for these two. Remember, you're in Logic, so if you want to turn input monitoring, you just have to click and drag. So these two, I have my synth connect to them. Now, if I play a note, my signal will be monitored for all the tracks that input monitoring is enabled. So both of these. I'm going to take it off. Now, when I select this option, though, only the selected track, the one that has the focus on, will have the input monitoring enabled. So again, this, let's open enable input monitoring for these three. So the one I select, the one that has the focus, will automatically have the input monitoring on as well. Okay. And underneath that, we have the independent monitoring level for record enabled channel strips. Now what this option does is to give us two monitoring levels, one for playback and one for record enable. So if I record enable this track and I change the, let me turn it on first, and I change the fader, I'm going to take it down a bit. Now you'll see when I turn uh, arm record on and off, I will get two, two monitoring levels. Now bear in mind, this does not affect your recording level. If your input signal goes to, let's say, minus 6 dB, then no matter what happens here, it will still, still be at minus 6 dB. This is simply for monitoring. Now I don't think I mentioned it yet, in audio production, by monitoring, we mean to hear back in real time. I'm going to turn that one off. And now let's go to the recording tab for a bit. Now up here, we can select the audio file type. Wave, yes, it's pronounced wave, is the most widely used and it is the industry standard. It was developed by Microsoft though, so Apple had to, had to answer that and they developed their own, the AIFF, Audio Interchange File Format. Now, CAF, Core Audio Format, was again developed by Apple, and it was designed to improve on the limitations of WAVE and AIFF. It can technically hold more data. Our Apple loops are in this format. I can personally tell you that AIFF works in both Ableton Live and Pro Tools, but I haven't tried it on any other DAW. I'm assuming it's fine, but if you want to be sure, just go with Wave. Now, everything we've seen so far, 
you only have to take care once. Once you set it up, then each time you load, load logic, it will remember those settings. Now that we've done that, let's close that and let's have a look at the inputs. Now there are two ways of doing that. You can either do it through the channel strip or through the mixer when you can see what type of inputs we have for its channel. So let's do this, this one that has no input. So I'm going to the inputs and I'm going to the input list and I'm going to select two. Now how big your input list will be depends on how many inputs your audio interface has. So mine has two, so I only get two options. Now since I connect my synthesizer to input two, I'm going to select that. If you create a new track through the choose a track type, type window, remember, command option and N as in November, you get the option of selecting your input down here. If you're wondering what all of these options are, you can have a look on the tracks part one video. I think it's the seventh video of this tutorial series where I go into detail about all of these. So let's cancel that, go back and let's record something. So I'm going to press Control R to enable recording, to enable record. And now I'm going to play on my synth, but I get no sound back. So I'm going to press Control I to enable input monitoring. And now I have monitoring. Now, extremely important information. I'm going to take this one off for now because it has a bit of sound. If you keep anything from this video, let it be this. Do not record as hot as you can. Now, most people, especially beginners, myself included, when I first want to record, try to get as close to zero as they can. They think that if they don't, their recording won't be loud enough. Do not worry about loudness. Loudness comes at the mastering stage. Now, during recording, you need a healthy signal that is above the noise floor, which we have already discussed in the sample rate and bit depth video. And once you have a healthy signal and a lot of headroom, then you can raise it and make it as loud as you want, but after you have recorded it. So now if I play something, let's turn this back on. You can see that my signal is way too hot. It goes quite close to Unity. We are at minus 1.1. So I'll turn it down on my audio interface and then check the levels here. Remember, it won't do anything if you just turn this one down. This is simply for monitoring. You have to do it in your audio interface. So I'm going to play and monitor here. Reset it. That's much better. Now I will make a video on that where I will explain everything in great detail, but what you need to know is that in general you want your RMS, which is the average of your signal, to be at least at minus 18 dB. And your loudest peaks should not go above minus 8 dB. And there's a reason for that. 0 dB VU, which comes from the analog world, is equal to minus 18 dBFS which is the digital world. So the 0 dB uh, VU on the consoles, which was fine to be around that, translates to minus 18 dBFS in the digital world, which is what we are using right now. Now, personally, I go even lower. I keep my RMS, my average, at minus 24 dB, with my loudest peaks going all the way up to minus 12 dB. So if you want to see how that works, check my recording tutorials. Every single instrument on these videos was recorded with that principle. Now, before we record, I want to show you a few more options that may help you. Now, if you remember, the record button has a menu when we right click on it. So let's go to recording settings. Now, instead of counting in bars, you can choose record pre-roll to have a counting in seconds. I don't want that, it's a bit confusing. 
the allow tempo change uh, recording is used if you want to record a tempo change while recording. So you can for example connect a MIDI controller and make changes while it's playing back. Automatically colorized takes will be looked at uh, in the next video. So now that everything is ready to go, I can start recording. So I'm going to place my playhead on bar 5. I've got that's one bar, that's fine. I can either press record up here or I can use the shortcut and press R as in Romeo. I'm going to turn the click on as well. And that's it, let's try it. That's it. Now, if this is too small and you can't see the waveform, you can use this button right here. Just click on it and then drag it up or down to make it bigger. I know the graphics are not the best in Logic, but that's what we, we are working with. Now, there's one more thing that I want to show you. You can click up here as well or simply just press F as in Foxtrot to open the browsers. Now, here we have every single file audio file that is in our project. If it's too small, you can always just go here, come on, and extend it. Okay, now as you can see, there is a gray area right here. So that means that there is more of my recording. And that is because I have used the counting. So when you press the counting, recording starts from when you press play, not from where you set your playhead to record. So if I grab this one and extend it, you can see that I have more of my recording here. And the way to extend that is to go to the bottom left corner or bottom right. And lastly, anything that I have here, I can just simply click and drag. This usually works. <laughs> ah, there you are. And just drag it to any of the channels that I want. And now that, that will be another one. And that, that's it for the basic recording. I'll see you in the next one.